for years, I described myself as someone who wasn't prone to anger. I don't get angry, I said. I get sad. I believe this inclination was mainly about my personality, that sadness was a more natural emotion for me than anger, that I was somehow built this way. It's easy to misunderstand the self as private, when it's rarely private at all, it's always a public artifact, never fixed, perpetually sculpted by social forces. In truth, I was proud to describe myself in terms of sadness rather than anger. Why? Sadness seemed more refined and also more selfless, as if you were holding the pain inside yourself, rather than making someone else deal with its blunt force trauma. But a few years ago, I started to get a nod in my gut at the canned cadences of my own refrain, I don't get angry. At the shrillest moments of our own self-declarations, I am X, I am not Y, we often hear in that tinny register another truth, lurking expectantly, and begin to realize there are things about ourselves we don't yet know. By which I mean that at a certain point, I started to suspect I was angrier than I thought. Of course, it wasn't anger when I was four years old, and took a pair of scissors to my parents' couch, wanting so badly to destroy something, whatever I could. Of course, it wasn't anger when I was 16 and my boyfriend broke up with me, and I cut up the inside of my own ankle, wanting so badly to destroy something, whatever I could. Of course, it wasn't anger when I was 34 and fighting with my husband, when I screamed into a pillow after he left the house so our daughter wouldn't hear, then threw my cell phone across the room and spent the next 10 minutes searching for it under the bed, and finally found it in a small pile of cat vomit. Of course, it wasn't anger when, during a faculty meeting early in my teaching days, I distributed statistics about how many female students in our department had reported instances of sexual harassment the year before, more than half of them. A faculty member grew indignant and insisted that most of those claims probably didn't have any basis at all. I clenched my fists. I struggled to speak. It wasn't that I could say for sure what had happened in each of those cases, of course I couldn't, they were just anonymous numbers on the page, but their sheer vol seemed horrifying. It demanded attention. I honestly hadn't expected that anyone would resist these numbers or force me to account for why it was important to look at them. The scrutiny of the room made me struggle for words just when I needed them most. It made me dig my nails into my palm. What was that emotion? It was not sadness. It was rage. The phenomenon of female anger has often been turned against itself, the figure of the angry woman reframed as threat, not the one who has been harmed, but the one bent on harming. She conjures a lineage of threatening archetypes, the harpy and her talons, the witch and her spells, the medusa and her writhing locks. The notion that female anger is unnatural or destructive is learned young, children report perceiving displays of anger is more acceptable from boys than from girls. According to a review of studies of gender and anger written in 2000 by N.M. Kring, a psychology professor at the University of California, Berkeley, men and women self-report anger episodes with comparable degrees of frequency, but women report experiencing more shame and embarrassment in their aftermath. People are more likely to use words like bitchy and hostile to describe female anger, while male anger is more likely to be described as strong. Kring reported that men are more likely to express their anger by physically assaulting objects or verbally attacking other people, while women are more likely to cry when they get angry, as if their bodies are forcibly returning them to the appearance of the emotion, sadness, with which they are most commonly associated. Photo illustration by Matthew Borel. Source photograph of model, Andrea Skeen, Getty Images. A 2016 study found that it took longer for people to correctly identify the gender of female faces displaying an angry expression, as if the emotion had wandered out of its natural habitat by finding its way to their features. A 1990 study conducted by the psychologists Ulf Dimberg and L.O. Lundquist found that when female faces are recognized as angry, their expressions are rated as more hostile than comparable expressions on the faces of men, as if their violation of social expectations had already made their anger seem more extreme, increasing its volume beyond what could be tolerated. And what happened? Her account of the 2016 presidential election, Hillary Clinton describes the pressure not to come across as angry during the course of her entire political career. A lot of people recoil from an angry woman, she writes, as well as her own desire not to be consumed by anger after she lost the race, so that the rest of my life wouldn't be spent like Miss Havisham from Charles Dickens's Great Expectations, rattling around my house obsessing over what might have been. The specter of Dickens is ranting spinster, spurned and embittered in her crumbling wedding dress, plotting her elaborate revenge casts a long shadow over every woman who dares to get mad. If an angry woman makes people uneasy, then her more palatable counterpart, the sad woman, summons sympathy more readily. 
she often looks beautiful in her suffering, and oblique transfigured, elegant. Angry women are messier. Their pain threatens to cause more collateral damage. It's as if the prospect of a woman's anger harming other people threatens to rob her of the social capital she has gained by being wronged. They are most comfortable with female anger when it promises to regulate itself, to refrain from recklessness, to stay civilized. Consider the red carpet clip of Uma Thurman that went viral in November, during the initial swell of sexual harassment accusations. The clip doesn't actually show Thurman's getting angry. It shows 